Okay. And we're off. Okay. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? <clears throat> Mrs. Beck, Mrs. Becker. Mr. Sismar. Here. Mr. Cummings. Here. Ms. Guas. Here. Mrs. Herrick. Here. Mr. Hong. Here. Mrs. Reese. Here. Mr. Winston. And President Lax. Here. We have a quorum. Please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the rights of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed and acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the East Brunswick Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof posted at the East Brunswick Board of Education offices. Written notice was also provided to the Sentinel, the Newark Star-Ledger, the Home News Tribune, and the Municipal <coughs> Clerk of East Brunswick. All Board of Education meetings with the exception of executive session discussions are videotaped for later broadcast. It is the policy of the Board of Education that videotaped meetings are not edited for any purpose. Individuals who speak at the Board's public meetings should be aware of these videotaping rules. Good evening. Um, I believe TAP is also on here, correct? This may be an old that I read. We're now doing the alternate press. For the advance notice? Yes, and the alternate press. And the alternate press. My apologies for that omission. Um, I am going to now ask for, see it threw me for a second. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask, whereas the Board of Education must discuss matters which are not appropriate for discussion at a public meeting, and whereas these subjects are within the exceptions to the Open Public Meetings Act and are permitted to be discussed in closed section, session, the Board of Education intends to discuss matters as follows, those items listed on tonight's agenda. The length of closed session is estimated to be one hour, after which the public meeting of the Board shall reconvene and action will be taken. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the East Brunswick Board of Education will recess into closed session for only the aforesaid subjects, and be it further resolved that the East Brunswick Board of Education hereby declares that discussion of the aforesaid subjects will be made public at a time when the public's interest in disclosure is greater than any privacy or governmental interest being protected from disclosure in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. So moved. Moved by Mr. Cummings. Second. Second by Mr. Sismar. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. We shall see you in an hour. Okay, welcome back and welcome to our guests. I see some celebrities in the first row. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but before we get to the exciting stuff, we are going to let Dr. Valeski do his report. See, see if he can be as good as you. I was going to say, President Lax, my stuff's not exciting. It's very exciting, but <laughs> all right, That's right, all right. I'm not as exciting or as good looking as these students. As these kids. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It is great to see you all. The artwork on display in the boardroom this evening was created by students from Central Elementary School. The art teacher of these talented students is Angeliki Karakoglu. Dr. Michael Gaskell is the principal. The high school AP Ipple team took, believe it or not, first place in the New Jersey State We the People competition. Again, say it again. I'm gonna say it. On Wednesday, January 24th, earning the right to represent New Jersey at the We the People National Finals being held in Washington, D.C from April 13th through April 15th. The students testified in front of school administrators, attorneys, professors, and members of the New Jersey government about different aspects of the Constitution, from philosophical foundations to modern controversies. This is the school's 32nd state championship, and the students are very excited to represent New Jersey at the national finals. And so. I see Dr. Yeah. There. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah. On Sunday, January 28th, high school juniors um, Adam Acevedo and Kathleen Menta had their artwork chosen to be exhibited at the 32nd Annual Art Administrators of New Jersey Emerging Artists Gallery at Kane University. All pieces on display were judged by Kane University Art Education faculty, and nine were chosen to receive awards, including. Adam Acevedo, who received an honorable mention for his piece, 
entitled Container. The students were sponsored for this exhibit by high school art teacher Lisa Gombas and supervisor of arts education Michelle DeGrosa. On Tuesday, January 30th, the high school was recognized for its outstanding German program. The high school was welcomed into the circle of posh schools, and that is an acronym for Schools Partners of the Future, joining a select group of only 14 schools in the United States who have earned this distinction. With this recognition comes a wealth of opportunities for students to participate in educational projects, competitions, receive learning materials, study, advice, and become members of the Posh Alumni Network. German language teachers will have the opportunities to attend regional and national training, receive internship opportunities, participate in projects, and join in a vast network of educators who share their passion for German language and cultural exchange. The Great Kindness Challenge is a worldwide event that is celebrated recently throughout our elementary schools. This program provides powerful tools that actively engage students, teachers, administrators, families, and communities in creating a culture of compassion, acceptance, unity, and respect. The students and staff at Hammersholl participated in a week-long celebration of spreading kindness through various spirit days. Students also began to submit applications for the upcoming Butterfly Effect event and that is an EBEF sponsored program where the winners will receive funding to have their kindness ideas come to fruition. Also at Hammerschold, every single student wrote on a post-it and act of kindness they could do for their community. And all the notes were put together to make a butterfly. The Bound Monroe School-wide act of kindness for the Great Kindness Challenge Week was Two Lunch Tuesday. Students donated lunch bags with kind messages and collected nearly 100 bag lunches to donate to Elijah's Promise Soup Kitchen in New Brunswick. The school theme at Irwin School this year is Great Minds Grow Here. And one of the ways that students grow is in their understanding of cultures and ethnic ethnicities within our school community. Students in the ESL classes created a project entitled being bilingual is a gift and did writing assignments on why their experience as a multi-language learner enriches their lives and the lives of others. And we are proud of our multi-language learners at Irwin School and they make Irwin a special place to learn and grow. The eighth and ninth grade students of the Movement, Mindfulness and Stress Management class at Churchill organized a mindfulness fair as their final project. They created a space dedicated to promoting mental well-being and mindfulness practices. The fair featured various interactive booths and activities aimed at fostering mindfulness, stress reduction, and an emotional awareness. Students creatively presented techniques to fellow students and staff that were invited to attend. The event not only showcased the students' understanding of mindfulness, but also provided a meaningful and engaging experience for all participants highlighting the importance of mental health in our school community. The Early Learning Academy, also known as ELA, has been cooking up some fun. ELA students created their very own pizza shop in the classroom and enjoyed working together to see their ideas come to life. The students are also strengthening their fine motor skills, building relationships, and really enjoying their time together. ELA students are also working together with friends to build literacy skills and problem solve. Now the one thing they need to work on is delivering those pizzas to our office. Uh, no. <laughs> In sports, girls swimming are back-to-back -back GMC champions. Nice. Boys swimming, I can applaud for that. Boys swimming are GMC champions for the third year in a row. Congratulations to our January High School Athletes of the Month. Students were selected for this honor by the coaching staff based on performance, demonstration of leadership, effort and practice, and of course for modeling exceptional character. The girls softball and field hockey project broke ground in mid-December with site work in process since then. 
These are some aerial photos of the work currently underway. The construction schedule estimates the project to be completed by around June 1st of 2024. Of course, this is weather permitting and without any delays in material suppliers. And we'll be providing additional updates as this project progresses and look forward to its completion. And we have a video to show oh, you yeah. some drone footage. And the trick is not to get dizzy when you're watching. Yeah. <laughs> And Mr. Giuliano is overseeing this project. Did you want to say anything about anything to, about progress or updates or? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> do, you want, do you want to commit to the timeline? I or? just keep my fingers crossed because yeah. everything is weather permitting. You know, yeah. hope, we don't, hope, hope we don't get inundated with rain or snow. Um, no, and, no snow. Uh, no and no uh, supply chain issues. Yeah. Those are the critical issues. As long as we don't hit any bumps with those areas, we should be fine. When the project's done, it's going to be fantastic. Yes. Yeah. And finally, the East Brunswick Boys and Girls Wrestling Programs, not finally, wrestling programs, ran a fundraiser at our home match with Perth Amboy Boys and Girls Wrestling Programs that celebrated the Marissa Tafaro Foundation. The foundation donated $1,000 each to the Mayor Cohen Charity Fund and the Perth Amboy Raritan Bay YMCA. And President Lex, did you have anything to say? <laughs> and I attended my first wrestling match. And our girls, I've never seen, I've never watched the wrestling, but it was wonderful. Our girls are really good because this is They're a two year old program. Yeah, yeah. They are spectacular. Yeah. Um, I have to say. So it was pretty neat. And, um, it's, it's a very beautiful foundation, the Tafaros. Uh, he actually was a longtime uh, contributor to sports in um, the home news. He was the sports contributor, and his wife is a uh, principal in Edison. They're very good people, and unfortunately, they lost their daughter years ago, and this foundation works um, within Middlesex County to give funds to um, different organizations that help with pediatric patients and anything with pediatrics. Um, they're beautiful people. And it was an honor to be there. Uh, but our kids, wow, they were terrific. And what's really nice about this particular match is both teams, both East Brunswick and Perth Amboy, is they raised the funds and then the uh, foundation matched mm -hmm. up to a certain amount. So it shows you not only are kids incredible um, on the wrestling mats, but they actually have kind hearts to do that as well. So yeah. it's a great, uh, great organization, great, great to meet. Great, great stuff our, our kids are doing, our athletes mm -hmm. and all of our students. And I would like to remind, once again, the community that we have used our two emergency closing days. And unfortunately, school will be open on Monday, February 19th, as indicated on our school calendar. Sorry. Thank you. I'm just laughing, thinking Mother Nature could mess with you and it could snow that day. It could. <laughs> and it has happened before. Yes, it has. <laughs> yeah. It keeps us on our toes. <sighs> Look at this. We don't play favorites, obviously, with all of our elementary schools. We love them. But um, there's a couple of memorial parents up here. And um, some of my fondest memories were the Wax Museum. I still have the pictures. And I see some friends in the audience. But these are my new friends up in the front I'm very excited about. So we are going to hear the third grade students at Memorial Elementary School talk about the Wax Museum that teaches about important historical figures. They get to choose significant figures in American history, use online tools, print text to gather up the information. They plan, edit their speeches. And then they do the wax museum. Do they still? No, you're doing this now. So is it indoors then? It used to be outdoors along the path? OK. So, so my third grade friends, I'm um, going to invite you up. Um, Mrs. Jones, I see your principal's here. Some of your teachers are here. So um, however you'd like to, to, to take it away, um, Memorial. I know. <laughs> hours. <laughs> Oh, 
actress than I look. I think she's a different Thank you for coming. We're very excited. <laughs> uh, as uh, they said, they uh, researched the historical figures. Um, they wrote speeches, they planned, they edited, and then they presented. And they did an awesome job. So we're excited to hear. The coolest thing about songwriting is that you have a framework of emotion and you can fill in the blanks with pieces of your own life. I am Olivia Isabel Rodrigo. I was born on February 20th, 2003, in Marietta, California. Something I want you to know about my early life is I took singing lessons growing up. At age 12, I got a part on the show Bizarre Bar. I learned how to, I learned how to play piano with the school played both growing up. Later in life, I started in the show High School Musical the Musical the Series. I got nominated for four 2022 Grammy Awards. I won three MTV Video Music Awards. I worked with a professional songwriter and released my debut album. It quickly hit number one on the Billboard 200 album. I'm famous for acting and singing. I would describe myself as creative, unique, and talented for my acting and my music. Some of my most popular and well-known songs are Good For You, Driver's License, and Vampire. My wish for the world is for everyone to follow their dreams and never give up on their dreams. Everyone can't be perfect. Practice does not make perfect. It makes progress. I'm Louis Lionel Andres Messi. I was born in Rosario, Argentina, 1987. I was born with a rare disease and I started to play soccer at age 8. At age 13, I went to training with Barcelona. Later in life, I won two <coughs> golden balls in the Golden Boot. In 2021, I won the Copa del Rey 4 to 0 and signed a two year contract to win the World Cup. I am famous for playing soccer and I describe myself as fast, smart, and talented. My wish for the world is for everyone to be a good person. Life is a roller coaster, so have fun with it. Hi, I'm Ceylon Bias. I was born on March 13, 1957, <coughs> at Columbus, Ohio. I really loved gymnastics as a kid. In fact, I won a ball to bat in 2012. In 2016, I almost quit gymnastics because I kept falling on the balance beam. I won four gold medals and one bronze of 2016 Summer Olympics. When I was 19, I had 17 gold medals. In 2018, I won my fourth world championship. Don't forget, if you're having fun, that's when the best memory is your book. Hi, my name is Olivia Isabel Arquita. I was born and raised in Marina, California. I'm famous for being an American song songwriter, singer, and actor. I also play guitar and piano. I'm 20 years old today. My birthday is February 20th, 2003. I've been singing since I was four. I became famous at the age of 13 years old. I also started the high school music club and music club this year. When I was 12 years old, I, sh I started the show The Bad Boy. Also, when I was growing up, I took singing lessons. My latest album is that. That's it. Thanks for coming. What a nice job. You guys did great. Mrs. Jones, I noticed something really interesting since my days. The historical figures have gotten much more modern. My daughter was Betsy Ross, and I think my son was Thomas Jefferson. 
Wow, this was really cool. You guys did a spectacular job. I thank you so much for bringing um, Memorial back to me um, and for bringing this wonderful project to all of us. Thank you to Mrs. Jones, your incredible teachers. Um, and I'm going to take a quick recess so you guys can get back. You may have some homework to do. Um, so thank you again for coming and showing us what's going on in your uh, neck of the woods. Good night, everyone. And now, Joe, you get to follow that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I always seem to follow, you know, yeah. the kids that do great jobs presenting. So uh, I'm here to present the 2023 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report for the school district. Um, so just a couple housekeeping things before we get into the numbers. Um, for a number of years, we've received... Uh, independent assessments and recognition for excellence in financial reporting. The Association of, of School Business Officials International, we've received it for 10 consecutive years. Um, every year that we've applied for it, we've received it. Governmental uh, Finance Officers Association, uh, we just received word that we received the certification again for the 2022 audit and we'll submit for the 2023. So that makes eight out of nine years. Uh, the only year that we did not receive it was due to COVID. So, um, you know, I think we have a very good track record going and a consecutive streak, so very proud of that. So as I discussed the audit, um, it's important to know that there's different funds that uh, the district has to report on. The first and biggest fund is the general fund that captures the day-to-day the -day operations of the district, uh, salary for teachers, special education, uh, electricity, uh, gas, uh, health benefits. Um, so the day-to-day -day stuff. The special revenue fund, um, it's used to account for and re account for and report the proceeds for grants and other financial um, sources that are restricted. I always like to say that the special revenue fund, you know, it's grants, it, it's money that comes from outside organizations with strings attached, all right, whether it be state funds, federal, uh, EBEF, PTA, uh, they give us various funds and we have to do specific things with them. Capital projects fund uh, used to account for uh, construction projects, uh, but You'll all be happy to know there's not a slide for capital projects this year because we didn't have any expenditures. So I was going to leave it in and say, you know, everybody's favorite slide because it was blank. But uh, Debt service fund, uh, that's used to account for uh, principal and interest on bonds. Uh, we like to refer to it as like a mortgage uh, when we do big projects, like if we go forward with building a new high school or renovating the high school, we would do bonds, and the payment of those bonds would be accounted for in the debt service fund. And then we have the enterprise fund. Enterprise fund is unique to governmental entities. Uh, the purpose of an enterprise fund is to make money. It's to run it as a business. Um, it's, we provide goods and services that are financed through user charges. So the district has four enterprise funds, and I will get into those uh, later in the slides. So the general fund revenue, we had for the 2023 year, we had 178 million in revenue. Uh, by far the largest piece was local tax levy, just like every other school district in the state. Uh, majority of the, the revenue that comes in for the general fund is through local taxes. Um, we had tuition from other school districts and, and parents of 658,000. Know, yeah, when I'm standing way over here, I think I need stronger glasses. Uh, 628,000, excuse me. Uh, other of 2.7 million. Other is comprised of uh, interest on our bank accounts, uh, refund the prior year, uh, expenses, E-rate uh, fees that we charge for athletics and clubs, uh, miscellaneous items that add up to that 2.7. Uh, state sources, state aid, uh, we refer to it as, uh, of 37 million. Federal sources of 176 million, that's our semi money 
that were required to budget. Um, and then we had transfers from our enterprise funds of just over a million dollars. General fund expenditures of 186,000. So the first question might be, well, how do we only bring in 178 million, but we spent 186? So it's important to note that, you know, with the accounting process and we're budgetary based accounting, we had encumbrances from the prior year that were not spent that roll over. All right, so that's part of it. Um, we had withdrawals from capital reserve, all right, so that's part of it. So it, the revenue coming in does not necessarily equal the expenditures because of the, the function of how the accounting works. So to go over it, uh, 190 million, or I'm sorry, 90 million uh, was for instruction purposes, for special education, uh, regular instruction, student related services. We had uh, 30 million for employee benefits. That's health benefits, uh, unemployment, workers' comp, uh, everything that falls in. And it's important to note these categories are not determined by us. This is all determined by uh, the state chart of accounts. We have to put uh, the expenses into these categories. Uh, student transportation of 13869000 Charter school of over $4 million. Uh, plant operation and maintenance, that's the electricity, uh, custodial, upkeep of the grounds, security of $18 million. Uh, district and school administration, uh, human resources, finance, information technology, legal auditor, insurance, all that group of 12 million, and then uh, short-term debt of 8.8 .8 million, and then capital outlay of 4 million seven, uh, 478,000. At the end of the year, we had fund balance of $21 million, comprised of the unemployment compensation reserve, uh, two reserves for, uh, to go against tax relief uh, for the current 23-24 school year and also going to the 24-25 school year of 4.6 million. Legally reserved, the 2% um, by state code, we have to keep that 2%. Um, reserve for encumbrances, as I talked about before, uh, it was 2.3 million. Just to give you context, for 2022, it was 7.4 million. So that's part of the reason why the revenues and expenditures don't, you know, are not the same. Um, and then we had legally restricted for capital improvements of 5.4 million. <clears throat> and by all means, if the board has any questions while I'm going through, please feel free. All right. So then we get into the special revenue fund. Uh, just to highlight some of the major grant awards, uh, the chart shows what we re, uh, the awards were in 2022 compared to 2023. Uh, EBEF in 2022, 192,000 compared to 23, uh, which was 66, almost 67,000. Um, for PTA and other, uh, 2022 was over $2 million, and 23 was 91,000. So the big difference there, um, was some uh, COVID relief money for technology. Uh, we had to account for it in other, and, and that was 1.9 million. So that, that's the big gap okay. there. Um, IDEA went up by like $100,000. Uh, the title grants, which is NCLB, uh, stayed pretty much stagnant. And then the adult basic ed grant uh, increased by a little bit, by about $15,000. Before you go on to that slide, yep. you said a, a question. Um, I know the PTA, you accounted for that one. The EBEF, that uh, dropped by quite a bit. Was there any particular reason for that? Yes, yeah, um, it's not under our control. The EBEF determines what they fund and how they fund it. So um, I'm just wondering, I know did, they, did, did teachers put in for less grants that year? Do we know? Not that I'm aware of. I, I, I know the EBF has um, funded a lot of stuff outside the district. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. And just to clarify, when Joe says fund things outside of the district, direct funds to the teachers mm -hmm. rather than flowing them through the district. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and we do not account if it, they pay something directly to a teacher, that's between them. Gotcha. We don't get involved. I just wanted to ask, uh, back, I guess, two pages. I'm sorry, Doug. How many charter schools? Um, our uh, we have the TICVA, which is the big one, and then we usually have two other. Um, Greater Brunswick. Right. Uh, in Edison, there's one. Thomas, thank you. So, and there's like two kids that go to each, one or two kids, and that varies from year to year. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, on the expenditure side, um, <coughs> again, uh, EBEF. We spent $169,000. So the question might come up, well, how do we spend 169 when we only receive 60 something? So the year of award doesn't mean we spend it necessarily in that year. Um, most grants, it's a two year window. Um, with the EBF, if a grant is continuing and we ask for an extension, they're, they're pretty uh, you know, willing to do that. Um, so it, it doesn't correlate to receive the, the money in year one, spend it in year one. Uh, PTA, uh, we spent you know, $46,000 compared to the 2.1 the year before. And again, that has to do with the uh, technology grant that I referenced before. Federal, um, we spent $10.6 million compared to 4.8. That's all related to COVID money. Um, that we were spending, that we received in prior years, uh, and projects we're finishing up. Uh, State-related money, uh, those are your non-publics. Um, we spent 565000 uh, this past year, and then other uh, 871000 compared to uh, uh, just over a million. Other uh, is all lease-related expenditures uh, and captures everything else besides those main categories there. As I stated before. I think we have a question for you. I'm yep, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Quick question. Uh, ESSER funds, when do they end? Most ESSER funds are ending uh, October 2020, uh, August. Okay, sorry. Thank you for Tara. I keep on telling her she should be doing this next year. So, uh, so yeah. They end September. September 30th. Yeah. September 30th, 2024. Yep. We're at the end. And we're on track to spend the, the money that we were allotted. We're not returning anything. <laughs> okay. Capital reserve. Like I said, we didn't have any expenditures, so there's nothing to report there. Uh, debt service. As of June 30th, 2023, we had bonds payable of just over $57 million. They were comprised of three projects, the first being uh, the 2022 refunding bonds. Uh, there's 40.8 million left. Uh, these bonds relate to the Hammersold, Central, and Lawrencebrook projects uh, that were done back in 2012. Uh, the 2020 refunding bonds, uh, 9.3 million. That's for Memorial. And then we have the 2018 Energy Savings Improvement Program of 6.9 million. And just because accountants like to make it difficult in the state, that those payments are accounted for in the general fund, but they're reported in the debt service because they are bonds. All right. um, so it's important to note uh, the word refunding on the first two issues. Uh, the district is very aggressive uh, to take advantage of the ability to uh, refinance the bonds at lower interest rates, saving the taxpayers money. All right. when Interest rates go low, we refinance when we can, and it reduces our, our interest payments. It's like refinancing your house. Continue with debt service. Um, our debt limit is $350 million, which is a calculation of 4% of the average equalized valuation. The net debt is $58 million, almost $59. Um, so just in case if there's a question, how can we have 57 million in bonds payable, but 58 million in that debt? It's because how we account for premiums and discounts on the bonds. All right, so that number, it's a calculation-based thing and it, it doesn't equal exactly, but it's correct. It's not, not a mistake. Then we have our legal debt margin, 
how much we can borrow, um, $291 million. So we're, we're in really good shape there. Getting to the enterprises, food service, total operating revenue of $2.6 million. That's from meal sales, whether free, reduced, paid, a la carte, breakfast sales, um, total non-operating revenue of $1.8 million. That's uh, the grant-related subsidies from the federal and state governments uh, for being on the uh, meal program. Total operating expenses of $3.7 million. Net change in position of $700,000. So Child Nutrition had another really good year. Um, to give perspective on the number of meals that we serve each year, the chart represents going back to 2017. Uh, yellow is the a la carte sales. Uh, lunch sales is the purple. Breakfast is the red. Uh, it's important to note that for 2022, meals were free to all students uh, as part of their um, the government program. Mm -hmm. 2023, we went back to normal service where uh, you know, paid was paid, free and reduced. Um, you'll see when everything was free, we served almost 1.3 million meals, uh, which is impressive. This past year, we we're just under a million, which is still impressive, and it's still, you know, significantly. No, we've had growth every year going back to 2017. Um, it's important to note for everybody watching at home that this is a program you know, going back 10 years ago that was struggling and had to be offset mm -hmm. by the general fund. Uh, the board made a commitment, our staff made a commitment to change, and you know, we, those changes are, have paid off. Um, and it's something I'm very proud of. So um, you should also note that breakfast is lower um, compared to pre-pandemic. Uh, we feel that's a, a result of the later start times. Uh, kids are eating, you know, because school is starting at 9 o'clock, so kids are typically eating before they come to school. But the later start time, I think everybody will agree, is the right thing for, for students. Community programs. We have revenue of $3.3 million. There's four distinct areas of operation in community programs. Uh, the early morning program, 500000 After school kids. Uh, 1.2, almost 1.3 million. Early Learning Academy, 1.1 million. And other, other is all the enrichment, um, whether it be for students, adults, uh, all, all those uh, virtual programs that we run. Uh, we had took in 357,000 for that. We had total expenses of 2.6, almost 2.7 million. So income of 623,000. We transferred 398000 uh, out to the general fund. Uh, it's important to note, just to go back to child nutrition, any money made in child nutrition, we're not allowed to transfer to the general fund. We have to keep it in the program and reinvest. So uh, that's why there were no transfers out of the food service. This chart shows um, the contribution to the general fund. Mm -hmm. A couple of meetings ago, there was a question about, you know, where is that money going? How, so uh, we thought it was important to, to show a little bit of history. Uh, going back to 2018, uh, you know, $500,000 to the general fund. The high water mark in 2019 was over $800,000. Then the pandemic hit, and uh, we lost money that year, and also in 2021, uh, because you know, we weren't in school. Those programs were not running, but we continued to pay, pay staff. Uh, 2022. We did make money, but we were recovering in that fund. Um, so I'm happy to report in 2023, we were able to um, you know, transfer money out and we're on the upswing. So that's a, a trend that we think will continue. Facilities rental. We had total revenue of 774,000, total expenses of 459,000, Income equal 314,000, and we transferred 500,000 to the general fund. We were able to transfer the 500,000 because of the prior year profit 
that we, we did not transfer, and you'll see from the slide, just like community programs, we had those three years where we did not transfer. Um, we were not renting out our facilities during COVID and the year after, um, and good part of the 2022 year. So we started back up, uh, we felt the, the facilities rental enterprise was in a good healthy place, so we were, that allowed us to do the transfer. And you Techn came back stronger than before. Yes, knock on wood, we are, we are doing very well. Facil uh, I'm sorry, technology. This is the second year for the technology coverage enterprise. Had total revenues of 191,000, expenses of 76,000, uh, income uh, profit of 115,000, and we transferred 102,000 over to the general fund. So those last three funds, uh, you'll remember the first pie chart of the revenue was a, uh, just over a million dollars of transfers to the general fund. Adding up those three transfers, uh, that's where the money came from. So financial facts. The district accounts for 25 bank accounts. We maintain compliance with all quarterly uh, tax filings and requirements. We issue over 4,000 tax forms between W-2s, 1099s, and 1095 forms. We process over 650 journal entries a year, 7,300 club and activity registrations, 1,500 <coughs> athletic and band registrations, over 1,000 uh, before and after school program registrations, process 800 plus after school enrichment registrations, over 6,900 purchase orders a year, 18,500 invoices are, or plus are process a year, uh, 5,500 uh, accounts payable checks, 37,000 paychecks, that's comprised of paper in direct deposit, 12,000 timesheets, 10,000 attendance slips, various bids and renewals, requests for proposals, requests for formal quotes, student service providers, it's the whole gamut. And everything that I just ran through has a piece of compliance that we get audited on. So excellence in financial reporting. Everybody knows the mantra for the district is excellence in academics, athletics, in the arts. I think based off of the last 10 years, I think financial reporting should also be part of that. I won't hold my breath. You know, uh, maybe I'll just put a sign in my office or something. Um, We're going to give you a mug. <laughs> so I, I, I do think we do a heck of a job. So I'll leave you with a couple quotes. Usually I do the puzzle. It's kind of gotten old, so I switched it up a little bit. Yeah. So perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. Vince Lombardi. If you haven't figured out, I'm a sports guy. So, yeah. uh, the strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each member is the team. And I have to say, it's not an individual, whether a board member, Bernie, Victor, myself, it's the team. And we could not be here with the excellence in financial reporting without the team. And that does, doesn't include finance, that includes you know, everybody in the district, it, it takes everyone to have success. And then finally, great things in business are never done by one person, they're done by a team of people. So, you know, it, I think we, we reflect that. And You, you do, know, could, could you actually, could you introduce your team, have them all stand so we can? So, uh, tonight in attendance, uh, is Tara Rosenbing. She's the senior manager of accounting. Uh, Lori Don't Taggarty. be shy. <laughs> Lori Taggarty is the purchasing manager. <laughs> Chetna Malpatra is the coordinator for facilities rental. <laughs> Michael uh, Capibianco, who is the Aramark manager for child nutrition. Kathy Rowe McKenzie, who's the coordinator of child nutrition. <laughs> Carla Hemingway is the secretary for child nutrition. <laughs> and last but not least, Jody Liberty. I wanted to introduce her last because 
I think unless she wants to come next year when she's retired, this will be the last time she shows up. So uh, I just wanted to give her a special shout out and uh, a big thank you. Uh, she's been in the department for a long while, and uh, uh, she'll be missed dearly when she retires. So. Joe, yes. maybe you should get Jody to give you a quote to put on next year's That's slide. Right. I have a feeling it'll say something about how great retirement is. And, uh, <laughs> It. So if there's no, any I thank you to you and your team. Excellent job, as always. You're right. You do get. I'm going to get you that mug. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions for Joe? Okay. I just thank like you. to take oh, a moment. Yes. You may have the moment as long as it's accolades for Joe. Just a just a moment. Because, and his department. Uh, I I absolutely agree with everything that Joe said. Um, he wouldn't have said it if I didn't say it was okay. <laughs> 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 Yeah. That's, that's seriously. Gonna, that's going to be the other mug at but, uh, but, seri yes. but seriously, yes. um, you know, Joe, Joe is my right-hand person, um, and I have relied on uh, Joe for many, many years. You've been with us for over 15 years now. 22 years. 27. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been here for 12. How can you be here for 22? Um, but... Um, uh, in addition to Joe, the entire team here, um, I do not have to worry a moment about what happens on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with finance. I have complete trust in the entire team, um, and they support us very well, and I am so very grateful for the work that they do. They so make you look you. good, Bern. And they make I us agree. all look good. I agree. We get to sleep at night because it's these true. people do a great job. And, and, and I, I want to add one more thing because I think this is important. There was a time many, many years ago where um, we didn't have a team. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not have the structure that we have now. And it is through the foresight of past boards and the support of all the boards through the current board that have allowed us to maintain the excellence that we have. So I am very appreciative for that support. Agreed. Thank, Thank you. Thank you again to you and your team. That's why you guys have to stand up and take those accolades, because you're kind of those unsung heroes. We don't get to, to say that enough. So, and because the party gets to keep on going, Scott Clellan is going to tell us even more detail what makes our <laughs> finance department a pillar of excellence. Welcome again, Scott. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Looking forward to the good news. I will be more than happy to. Um, just to piggyback kind of what on Joe was saying, um, I've said this in the past, but I'll say it again. Uh, no other school district that I audit or that I've known of that they can have somebody get up here and do what they should be doing, which an auditor should not be coming up here and presenting your numbers. We should be presenting what we're going to present. Your administrator, or your assistant administrator, or someone internally should present your numbers. They're your numbers. We just audit them. So Joe actually makes my job easier from a presentation perspective because he does normally what I would do. Mm -hmm. So Joe deserves a lot of credit for getting up here and, you know, he spent a half an hour going over a very, very detailed overview of what your school district is all about. And if you think about it, you're running a $180 million organization. That's huge. Um, made up of a lot of different areas, a lot of different funds, and a lot of different things that you, you operate. Look at all the enterprise funds you are operating. All separate entities, all separate controls. Look at all the grant money you've had. We've had so much COVID money coming in and out of district. So um, before I proceed, I just want to thank Joe for doing what he does and making my job easier from a presentation perspective. And he really should accept the accolades of the fact that he's the only one I know in the state that actually gets up here and does this. Um, so, thank you, Joe. Uh, thanks to Joe. Um, also, from a perspective of coming in here and preparing for the audit, um, we have planning meetings. We have meetings with the, with, um, the superintendent and Bernie and the staff during, before the audit, during the audit, after the audit, and then last week we met, or earlier in the week, we met with the finance committee to go over the numbers. And this is one of our nicest clients by far. Um, you're very, very lucky to have the administrative people in, in place that are here uh, because I ordered some districts that don't have people like that in place and the meetings are not as easy as these in terms of an audit presentation. There's a lot of findings and a lot of issues and the financial situations are not as managed as yours are. So um, again, accolades to the administration. 
So we're also several months earlier than we've been in the past. Um, the past couple of years, the state has been unable to provide us with some information. I think last year's order presentation was on March 30th. Uh, this year we're presenting in early February. The deadline last year was March 17th. This year the state decided th they would go back to the original deadline that's in statute, which is 12-5. Your audit was one of 28% of the school districts that filed by that deadline. So only, again, 28% of all the school districts filed by 12-5. As of last week, there's just over 60% that have filed. So there's still 40% of the audits out there that have not gotten uh, presented to the state. Um, so again, we had the issue of there's no way we're going to get all our clients done in this short period of time. We had to basically sit back and say, which ones do we think would make that deadline, meaning they're going to have the records ready for us. And obviously, this was one of the ones that we chose to go that route, knowing that Tara, Joe, and Bernie would have the information and would work with us to make sure we met the deadline. Um, again, I want to recognize everyone else in the accounting department, Tara and the team that she works with. Um, they really do a great job, and they make our, jo our job easier. They provide us everything very quickly, and they're very, very easy to deal with. So I want to thank them again for all the time they put in to help us during the audit process. Um, what our role is, is to take those numbers and order the different numbers that go through the funds and look at your government as a whole. And it's not just the financial side of things. There's a lot of different aspects that come into the audit. We look at the general and school administration. We look at instruction expenses, student services, transportation expenses, enterprise operations, your internal service operations for your self-insurance fund, and then capital improvements and debt service. There's a lot of pieces that we touch upon and a lot of different areas that we look at. We look at your um, ASSA, which is your application for state school aid, making sure you're reporting your students properly. We look at your DRTRS for your district report of transported students to make sure you're reporting that correctly to the state. So there's a lot of things we look at from a control and a compliance perspective. What are the objectives? We have to make sure we get the information necessary that we request to provide it to us, and we have to render an opinion on your financial statements. And there's different layers of opinions, some not so good, some very, very good. Um, so there's really four of them. Yours is unmodified, which is a clean opinion, which is the highest level that can be placed on financial statements. We also, as part of the audit, have to follow government auditing standards as a governmental entity. And that would include looking at internal controls over the way you spend your money, uh, which is looking at payroll, looking at disbursements and purchasing, looking at how your revenue is reported, and then a few minutes I'll talk about your grants as well. So part of it is to go through to identify if there's any major problems with your controls and if there's any compliance items that we've identified that are all either federally or state regulated. Uh, the last component of the audit really relates to your major federal and state grants. And based upon the selection criteria that we have to follow, um, this year, we had to test the IDA special education program, which is always your largest. We had to look at your CARES Act program, which is your, a your ARP money and your ESSER money, which I'm happy to report that we didn't find anything you have to give back, so I know Bernie wants to spend all the money. We didn't find anything that was not allowable that was of what we tested. And then we also looked at your ACERS program, which is the, the kids that are 21, over 21 that you're requiring to provide some services to. And we didn't identify any exceptions in there either. There are four parts to your annual comprehensive financial report. It used to be the CAFR, now it's the ACFR. Uh, the intro introductory section basically is a good section which has a good transmittal letter, talks about all the accomplishments. The financial section is where our opinion is located, as well as the MDNA, which is a real nice two year summary of your operating results uh, from year to year for the last two years and give some explanations as to why things were different. Your statistical section is an unaudited section uh, towards the back of the report that has 20 different schedules. It talks about different things regarding your, um, your different aspects like tax levies. Uh, it shows you student enrollment and, shows you, you sh and stuff like that. And then your single audit section is where we, we report on your various grants. So 
The audit results of, of after doing all the procedures on all the different funds and all the different enterprise funds, it's an unmodified opinion. The district is in very strong financial position. There were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies identified. Unmodified opinion on your, the way you spent your money for your grants. And there are no findings in the 2023 order report. Therefore, there will be no corrective action required by the board. And that wraps up my piece of it. Again, overall, great audit. Um, pleasure to work with you as a board as well as the administration. So thank you very much. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Outstanding. Again, thank you, Scott. Does You're any welcome. member of the board have any questions for Scott? All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, who else? Thank you. Scott. Guys and gals, awesome. Okay, hey, we are up to the good of the cause for the public. The Board of Education recognizes the value of public comments on educational issues. Uh -huh. Oh, did I? Right there. Oh, Matt, look at that. See, you know what? I, well, I, I my actually, apologies, I was gonna, Matt. I was going to let, since it's Jody's last meeting here, she could do the ethics training for us. Jody, would you like to? I just thought. Is it going away? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? See, I <laughs> She's going to come up. Come on up. Yes. You can help Matt. I'm not teasing you. No, I think you could, no, I think she should get to come and help you. If you want to do the ethics training. No, that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Jody says don't do anything. Be exactly. on the high from your yeah. big win. So good Sorry evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> what I've done is I've given you a, a, a handout, a multi-page handout that you can re read, take with you. We update this every year um, that goes over the School Ethics Act. The School Ethics Act is an act <clears throat> that all board members are duty bound to uphold. When you take the oath of office, you promise to support the Constitution of the United States, Constitution of the State of New Jersey. Within that, you, you support all the laws of the State of New Jersey. In, in among those laws um, is a whole section called Title 18. Title 18 are the laws that govern, govern school districts. And in Title 18, is the School Ethics Act, which governs the conduct of board members. <clears throat> the School Ethics Act has two components. One component, it deals with conflicts of interest. And then the other component is the actual school ethics code. So I'll summarize. Conf conflicts of interest, um, you can think about it. You can't vote on your, uh, if you're, you own a business, uh, they can't come be a vendor before the district and then you vote on it. <clears throat> uh, if you have a family member that works for the district, you can't be involved in, in, in voting on certain things. And it, there's lots of layers of it. So for example, um, there are many districts where you have board members who are elected, and prior to their election, they have a family member who might be a teacher, a paraprofessional, et cetera. Once that happens, that board member has lots of conflicts. They can't be involved in the um, <clears throat> Superintendent's evaluation, the assistant superintendent's evaluation, they can't be involved in any negotiations, can't be on negotiations committees, can't vote on the negotiation contracts, lots of bars. There are a whole host of cases that define it. We, and what we do is in each of the sections of the law, we give you cases and we update those cases every year so that you can see cases that explain when somebody did it wrong. Probably the most important thing in, that, in dealing with conflicts of interest Usually it involves family members. So the School Ethics Act has put out, <clears throat> School Ethics Act is overseen by a department which is within the Department of Education called the School Ethics Commission. The School Ethics Commission has put out two very, very important uh, forms and we have them at page four and page five of the handout. <clears throat> page four summarizes when you need to recuse yourself totally uh, based on a familiar relationship, what you can do and can't do. This generally arises in the context of the collective negotiations and or the evaluation of the superintendent or hiring of the superintendent. So let's just hypothetically say that you have a family member that works for the district. The School Ethics Act <clears throat> and the School Ethics Commission has said that because of that conflict, not only can you not evaluate the superintendent, you can't even vote if there was going to be a superintendent search on a search firm to search for a superintendent. You can have no involvement whatsoever. 
there became a lot of conflict over how far, what is a family relationship? So we, we can all, it's pretty easy. Your spouse, your kids, your brother, your sister, your mom, dad. Well, the School Ethics <coughs> Commission were, was coming up with all different rulings. And what they did very, is very useful. <coughs> if you look at page five, it breaks down what are familiar relationships. Cousins, nephews, sister-in-laws, brother-in-laws. We've included that chart. And the reason we have that, we've included this for you is it's just a good place to look if you have a question. What I've told the board before, and I'll tell you guys again, if you have a question, ask. Talk to Dr. Valesky, get, my, get me on the phone, we'll give you legal guidance. If it's something that's so unique, that there's not an answer, there's not a case out there that can give, you a, give us guidance, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of advisory opinions and decisions, we have the ability to write on your behalf to the School Ethics Commission and seek an advisory opinion. <clears throat> I caution all of you, if you vote and you had a conflict, we can't retroactively seek our advisory opinion and get you a go-free from junk art. You, you, you're, already, you're already in trouble. So if you have a question, it's always better to put on the brakes, ask Dr. Valesky, he'll reach out to me, we can research the issue, and if it's a very unique issue, and it actually happened here, we had one of the most unique issues. A number of years ago, you had a board member who was a phenomenal athlete, uh, I think, in college and high school. And <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a board member, she was a referee for NJSIA events. And she never, ever refereed any East Brunswick case. But then she thought to herself, well, if I go to a county meet and I'm at the county swim meet and an East Brunswick kid is swimming, am I in violation? Well, I can assure you there was no ethics opinion on that at anywhere, no advisory opinion. We went, wrote on her behalf, and got an advisory opinion, and they said she can do that. That is not a conflict. So we do have the ability, prospectively, to make an ask to give you guidance. <clears throat> the school, the code of ethics, which is contained in the School Ethics Act, um, is contained in there. And let, let me summarize, and I, I use this analogy, and I'll use it again. I used to use the uh, king and queen of, of, of Spain. I'm not doing that. We're going to do football because we're coming up on the Super Bowl. You guys are the team owners. You own the team. You sit up in the box. You have the nice big chairs. You have like the nice meals and stuff. Maybe Taylor Swift stops by. I don't know. Um, and you hire a head coach. And that head coach is that gentleman right there. And that head coach then goes out and gets the players, the quarterback, the the defensive lineman, whatever, he, you know, Dr. Valesky deems fit and comes before you and recommends, this is the team I want. This is who I want as quarterback. But he runs the day-to-day -day operations. You don't. You, you don't see Jerry Jones or, or Robert Kraft walking down from the booth, going on the thing, asking Bill Belichick how to make a play. They don't do that. Neither do you. You do not run the day-to-day -day operations. Board members get in trouble when they attempt to run the day-to-day -day operations. It's your job. You're a policy-making body. You draft policies. And what are the policies? They're the laws of the school. They are the laws that Dr. Valesky and all the staff and all the students have to follow. And it's Dr. Valesky's job and his team to make sure that those are followed. So you set the laws and say, Dr. Valesky, make sure these are followed. And you can change the laws. That's why you have a first reading and a second reading. And those are, are, are really you're setting the rules of engagement for how this district is operated. Your job is to make sure the districts are well run. You don't run the day-to-day -day operations. You make sure they're well run. And <clears throat> what you do is there's only one person that the board evaluates. In fact, there's only one employee that the board hires, Dr. Valesky. The board doesn't recommend anyone else's hiring. They approve Dr. Valesky's recommendations, but only Dr. Valesky can make recommendations on who to hire, and who to terminate, and who to not renew. You could look at his, his recommendations and say, we agree with them or disagree with them, but it's not the board's job to make hiring decisions. You hire Dr. Valesky, and if things are going great, you reward Dr. Valesky, and if things aren't going great, you say goodbye to Dr. Valesky. That's the job. You, he is your coach, very much like the NFL. Teams are winning, the coach stays. Teams are losing, the coach goes. I mean, it, it's probably the best analogy I can use. In the, in the code of ethics, I have cited a number of cases. There are more and more cases where 
board members are getting themselves in trouble utilizing social media. I, there, uh, one case happened up in Bergen County. <clears throat> the board president had a blog, his own blog, and he didn't care for the uh, association president. And he decided that he was going to be very critical of the local association, the NJA, and he had a, a disclaimer, this is my own opinion, it's the First Amendment, I can say whatever I want, I'm not saying on behalf of the board. But he kept going after this association president. Well, the association president was an employee of the district. And ultimately, the School Ethics Commission said, you can't do that. You, you, you can't just put up a disclaimer and then just bash people. That doesn't work. You're off the board. They removed them. Six months removal off the board. Because the other thing that you guys are is you're elected officials. You have by far the biggest impact in town on the tax base. You have by far the biggest impact on your property values, but you're also an employer. You hire him, but you guys are an employer. And so as a board, you are duty bound as individual board members to protect your employees. You might not always agree with them, but those discussions happen in closed session. You protect their confidentiality, you protect their reputations, and that's in the code of ethics. The other thing, um, and I've given other examples, there's another example where a board member did an op-ed piece, um, and this happened right before the pandemic, in which uh, he was supporting some candidates and then went after a sitting board member um, and said, don't vote for this person. This person's no good. These are my own opinions. I'm, I'm speaking on my own behalf. School Ethics Commission said that wasn't sufficient. That was not a, pro a disclaimer and you were bringing ill repute to the board. You have a First Amendment right to say things, but when you choose to be on a board, you have to confine yourselves and follow the School Ethics Act and the School Ethics Code. Um, I've, a I've been asked questions. I, I, I recently uh, prosecuted a case um, in which a board member was censured. She, her term had ended two years before the censure. So even though you're off the board, the cases still go on. I'm involved in the case right now. The board member's been off for almost two and a half years. That case is still pending. They don't just go away. They, these cases go on. Um, people don't give up their First Amendment rights when you're a board member, but you have to remember that when you're speaking, you have to make sure that you're speaking on your own behalf, not on behalf of the board. But if it touches the board, what the School Ethics Act says is, well, then you're not really spe you really are speaking on behalf of the board. And the School Ethics Act is getting stricter and stricter and stricter about this because as we all have witnessed in our, our lives, social media is dominant. I mean, you can, like newspaper, I don't know where you read the news anymore. You can't go to the newsstand anymore. You go on social media and whoever wants to say something, people read it on Facebook Live or Instagram, or not Instagram, what the heck is it called? Instagram, yeah. Um, as you can tell, I don't really use social media. But my point is, is that more and more of the cases are involving board members' uses of social media. And the one thing, the, when, when I, the one common denominator that you'll see in School Ethics Act cases is when you go after an employee, like that one board member is doing up in North Jersey, or you reveal confidential information about an employee or a student, that's when the School Ethics Commission has zero tolerance. They will remove you from the board. So. Um, again, if you have questions about the School Ethics Act, please uh, ask Dr. Valesky. We can give you specific legal uh, advice. I'm not going to give you legal advice tonight on specific instances because that is attorney-client privilege. But the School Ethics Act in and of itself, um, there's a plethora of cases that we can look at, give you guidance to make sure that you don't misstep when you're doing it. But ultimately, you're the elected official. You're the person who's duty-bound to read it, follow it, and Make sure that you, you, you live by the tenets of it, that you're making sure that the district is well run, not running day-to-day -day operations. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Matt. All right. And if you read it and you have questions, just ask Dr. Valesky. I'm, I'm glad to get on the phone. Thank you. Very thorough. And now it is time for the public portion. Let's see? I'm glad I didn't jump ahead of you. <coughs> All right, Bernie. 
So the Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. To protect the privacy of all students and staff, concerns regarding individual students and staff members should generally be addressed by first meeting with the appropriate administrative staff. In order to permit the fair and orderly expression of such comment, the board shall provide a period of public comment at every meeting of the board. It is limited to three minutes per speaker, and we remind you that anything that needs follow-up will be um, directed to the lovely ladies in the front so we can reach you. Um, that being said, is there anyone this evening wishing to speak to the board? A quiet crowd tonight. We had such wonderful presentations. Nobody wants to have it a shot. So, That being said, I'm going to now close the public portion, moving on to our agenda items of the evening. May I please have a motion for the one item on the Board of Education? Motion. Is that Lori? Second. Second by Heather. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor? I Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. I have three items this evening for curriculum and instruction. I apologize for the minutes. I should have abstained. Uh, it, the vote's closed. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. But that's okay. it's okay. It's not a problem. We'll forgive you. It's not actually a, a problem. You can vote on minutes even though you didn't attend. Oh, that's is not, that right? You yes. can. Oh, okay. Look at that. We've always, yeah, we've always yeah. abstained. So you don't have to abstain. Just a little tidbit of information yeah. you don't necessarily have to. You're voting on a minutes. If they're accurate, you can vote on them. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> All right. We learned something new. All right. Curriculum instruction. Who wants those three items? Come on. Somebody's got to take um, them. So moved. Mrs. Guas. Second. Mrs. Herrick. Is there discussion on curriculum and instruction this evening? There is. There is. Mrs. Guas, kick it off. Oh, I would just like to thank Dr. Bowley and the Ms. administration for expanding our Orton Gillingham trained teachers. Um, I know it's an expensive endeavor, but it is amazing to have this many teachers in the district available <coughs> for our students that need this. It's a very specific, specific training and well worth it. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe this is just a voice vote. Yeah. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very quiet crowd tonight. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Bring us to financial services. We have seven items this evening. Oh, so moved. Moved by Ms. Glass. Second. Second by Ms. Herrick. And is there any discussion on any of the seven items on finance this evening? No, this one is a roll call vote, so I will ask the secretary to please call the roll. Mr. Sismar. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. Glass. Yes. Mrs. Herrick. Yes. Mr. Hong. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. President Lax. Yes, motion carries. Bring us to the one item under human resources. Uh, no, we have an addendum as well. And we have an addendum as well. May I hey, please have a motion for the items so this moved. evening? Ms. Gloss? I'll second. And Thank Mrs. You, Mrs. Herrick. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Will the secretary please call the roll? Mr. Sismar. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. Gloss. Yes. Mrs. Herrick. Yes. Mr. Hong. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. President Lax. Yes. Motion carries. And bringing it home, student services. We've got three items this evening. Oh, so moved. And Ms. Gloss. Second. And Mrs. Yes. Herrick. Any discussion? Yes. Yes, Ms. Gloss. I was very excited and happy to see that we have a unified sports club happening at this is this one is Churchill, Churchill. right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a fantastic program. If anybody hasn't had any contact with it, it is bringing together uh, students with and without disabilities on the same team oh. for recreational activities. And I've seen so many students um, develop relationships that they wouldn't have otherwise. And many good special ed teachers came out of the high school students that played on the unified sports. So I'm really happy to see this here. That's great. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. So that's a really if I may, that's yeah. something that um, uh, Ms. Uh, Sultana Loraco uh, and also uh, Mr. Malta were very passionate about. And they came come together and brought student services in to, uh, to really make this happen. So uh, we're very fortunate uh, that they did this. I think it's going to be fantastic for our kids and our families. So I'm very excited about it. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Great job. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this one, I believe, is a roll call vote, so I'm going to ask the secretary to please call the roll. Mr. Sismar. Yes. Mr. Cummings. Yes. Ms. Gloss. Yes. Mrs. Herrick. Yes. Mr. Hong. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. President Lax. Yes. Motion carries. 
And lastly, we have new and or old business community reports, information items, and for the good of the cause for the board. Miss Plus. I'm just feeling talkative you are, tonight. Go. <laughs> I got sleep. I don't know. Uh, I shouldn't. I have a sick child. Um, I just wanted to say that it was exciting to be back at Memorial and participate. Memorial hosted the cake decorating contest last Friday. Um, it was really fun to watch. And at Churchill, it's much bigger now. And I appreciate the help from Chetna, who has now left, but she was a big help setting that up. But it was just great to watch the parents be involved with the kids together and to watch so many children eat so much icing that I didn't have to take home with me. So that was awesome. Um, and I also wanted to say that it was just a side note about the kindness week, but I, I only see one elementary school right now. But it was nice to see during the kindness week, one of the challenges one day was to come dressed as your kindness role model. Mm. And so I'm there at pickup, and you, you're sort of like anticipating who the kindness role models. I expected to see more Taylor Swift, I have to admit, <laughs> than what I saw. But what I saw was just children pouring out of the building dressed as their teachers. Aww. Yeah, so that's which was really beautiful to see. It was, I, my own went dressed as her teacher, um, but we have a small shrine to her at home. We love her. Um, <laughs> But the number of teachers that came, or the number of small people who came out wearing a lanyard that were obviously their teachers was just really touching to see what role models the teachers are for them and how positive it is. That's great. Teachers are good. Teachers are good. I just wanted to give kudos to the East Brunswick Symphony Orchestra. Uh, you know, Ms. Becker gave them a very wonderful uh, description of what they were going to do, and we all attended. A bunch of us were there. And uh, Cheryl Brass, who is uh, one of the uh, f family forces of that uh, orchestra, I give kudos to her and to the district. Also, we have many high school teachers that performed. Um, and those that were there, maybe you could add. But uh, I, I thought uh, Mr. Reiser, Mr. Lid, the recreation department, the mayor, I mean, it was just a whole, the, our district. It just was a wonderful group event. And it was West Side Story, and then there was classical music, so there was something for Star everybody. Wars. Star Wars. So, and, and I, they hope to do more classes, so that's something, again, the township and the, and the uh, school board, school working, the district working together, so it just was a beautiful night. It really was. I was excited when I saw my kids' uh, orchestra teachers on stage. Yeah, it was really cool. So, <laughs> I'm like, well, I guess they really did know what they were talking about, huh? <laughs> right? <laughs> they were wonderful. They performed beautifully. They did. They really did. I mean, the quality of the performance yeah. was uh, that of, like, the city. So. Yes. Mr. Cummings? I was know? digging the Jurassic, I think it was Jurassic Park uh, theme oh, song as well. Right. It was just an amazing, to your point, it was just really incredible. Um, I had a couple things that I just wanted to share and piggybacking off of Ms. Guas's points as well. I was, uh, Dr. Veleski, in your presentation on Kindness Week, I, I actually saw one of my children in one of those photos, uh, uh, which was pretty cool. And I'm going to talk to him about, you know, bringing that kindness to the home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> she's doing it at school. That's great, and, and love to, you know, work on the other side of things. But um, very, very cool. And then um, I also volunteer uh, when I can at Elijah's Promise. So I, I am on the other end of, of, you know, taking those bags that were put together by the Bowman Monroe community and handing them to people in need. So it's really special to kind of see how that all comes full circle. Uh, and, in, you know, I, I can see when I go there, obviously, the great need that is just so close in our own backyard here in New Brunswick. Um, so uh, just kudos to that community for doing that as well. I wanted to share uh, just one other thing. I, as many of you know, serve as the representative for the Human Relations Council in town. And we had our first meeting in January. It was a really great event. And we have a lot of really exciting initiatives planned for this calendar year that um, you know I'm just encouraging people to keep an eye out for that activity. And I'll be sure to share it here. But just some wonderful opportunities to continue to celebrate you know, the, the amazing diversity that we have here in East Brunswick and, and the richness of all of that. And just one final shout out to Joe and your team. Uh, every time I come here, I just get more and more impressed with the various layers of, of what go into making this, this whole community so special. And so, and, and every report that I continue to hear is, is you know, above the mark. Um, that's really awesome. So, you know, congrats to all of you and thank you for all of your service. Thank you. Mr. Oh, Sismar? Oh, sorry. Oh, mine was brief. I forgot. Um, last night was the parents' orientation or the parents' welcoming to Hughes. And for years of, you know, being a parent and listening to other parents be nervous about moving from their small neighborhood, you know, snug, warm, cozy, 
elementary schools into Hammersholt and now Hughes, there was always a bit of trepidation with the whole town coming together. And last night I was home and several of my friends have their first child moving up to Hughes. And my phone was exploding with messages written in all caps. Um, the sources of strength with like hearts all over it. Whatever our children did that were representing sources of strength was outstanding. The CARES program was outstanding. And just the further the night went on, the more texts I was receiving about how positive the experience was, how excited the parents were to send their children, because it was just the parents. Um, so kudos to the, or the Hughes staff for making it such a welcoming experience. The parents were, I've just never seen a group of adults so excited about the transition. Usually there's some hesitation. And I know we talked about with the grade realignment, you know, what would the reception be? And what happened last night was really positive. So thank you to the people who organized. Thank you. You know, actually, I was there last night. So why under the did door? Not text me. <laughs> yeah, but I was too excited to text you. So when I walk in the door, the lead, the little ambassador there, handing out flyers, show you big smiles, make the parents very relaxed, make this the little ones so excited they want to jump into the. Uh, to the port with those uh, little ambassadors. And the program itself, comp I went there last year, and this year, compared with the programs, this year is much, much better. I should give Mr. Potranko a lot of credit. He and his team prepared very well, not just to answer the questions, the presentation and the setup, everything was beautiful. So I want to give him a lot of credit. And this Saturday, East Brown's uh, Art Coalition is hosting a Chinese New Year party from 11 to 4 in public school. And there will be a lot of good things there. And my friends sponsor that program. You guys will have a lot of fun, I promise. So please go share some uh, culture there and enjoy some food. Maybe you get some great gift. I'm going to see you guys there because I will be there. <laughs> I have my tiger from last yeah. year. Thank you. Mr. Sismar. Just a couple quick things. I won't be as long as I normally am. Um, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the thing about the minutes. Um, you're going to hear me talk from time to time about Robert's rules. Our policy 164 to conquer the board meetings, it's what we're governed by. It's called parliamentary authority. Robert's rules of board are newly revised. So whenever there's a question of policy and procedure, that's like the Bible. Um, and I think that's one of the things you brought up. I don't even think, that, and I, I wasn't bringing up sight until you said it, but I don't even think a vote needs to be taken on the minutes. If there's no questions from the Florida presiding officer, I think can pass it through. But that wasn't my point of this. Um, last week, or two weeks ago, there was a question about yielding of time. Now, let me explain something from Robert Schul. It's called obtaining the floor. When a member is recognized to speak by the chair, that member holds the floor until they yield their position. So they really shouldn't be interrupted by anyone during that time, much like we do for the, uh, the session up here. Um, I just wanted to clear up a comment that was made about only uh, 10 times that we had a security committee meeting in four years. Uh, so I went into what the public could go into. And to be honest with you, I only did the past two years because that's what was available to the public. There was three in 2021, there was four in 2022, and the comment was, actually made that there was none in 2023. I have April 20th, May 22nd, August 31st, October 12th, and December 14th in 2023. So I don't want the public to have the impression, and any, anybody from the public can check where these meetings are. It's either in the closed session notes or the agendas that we actually had much more than 10 meetings in four years. And to say there was zero in 2023 gives the impression that we haven't talked about security at all in 2023 in a meeting setting. And that is false. And the last thing, uh, I don't want to go through the whole email that a gentleman sent us. I'm not going to give his name. But uh, he said he applauds the board for openly <coughs> discussing disagreements. Um, you know, it shouldn't be where, uh, uh, what do you say about, uh, some of the comments I won't say that. but. Disagreement is good. If we all sit up here and we just push everything right through, I think as long as we respect each other, respect each other's time, I think, I think we can disagree in a meeting. 
that's a good thing when we're talking about 180, 190 million dollars. Trust me, folks. So that's where I come from. When I'm up here, I do not intend to be divisive, but I do have my opinions, and I take it very seriously with every dollar that's spent in this district and the way things are, are run by policy. So that's all I have to say about that. So thank you. If I could, President Lex, uh, Mr. Sismar, just, just to clarify, I think the number that you're referring to for security meetings, that included closed, you, you said it included closed session uh, meetings as well, right? The numbers that you quoted. Those are the only, th the closed session, the only ones where it was listed. Okay. I don't have access to the other things. So it's probably 12 in the past two years plus the 10 that were, so it's probably in the realm of 22 times. Because we extracted, when we, when we extracted the committee meetings, we extracted the committee meetings that we had set up independent <coughs> of the board. So that's what the number was that we reported. So that's, I just wanted to clarify that. So I'm not debating Mr. Sismar's number. We can go back mm -hmm. and reconcile. But there certainly were discussions in closed session that we had, as he said, that related to security. We do have them on the closed session. And, and that's to the point is that's one of the reasons I wanted it because every meeting that you just referenced in 2023 was a committee meeting of the whole board, not a meeting of the security committee. Correct. And for, cl yeah, for clarification, we tried to set it up at other times. And I, I said this in the last meeting, board members weren't available and it's tough to get here. So Dr. Valeski had come to me as a chairperson and says, hey, Mark, do you mind if we move these into closed? So we had about the same number of meetings last year. Um, and my only point, and I was going to bring it up, but, but by getting rid of the security committee, it removes an option. That's all I was saying. I didn't say it's bad to talk as a board. I didn't say it's bad to have the meetings. I just think having all of them, it encapsulates them into a group of people that we can only talk amongst one another. It prohibits us from going out to other experts and discussing stuff that we discussed in closed session. And I won't go into the depth of that, but that's what it, it truly limits our options to have uh, security meetings and ideas. It doesn't, it doesn't at all make this, the district less safe as far as the day-to-day -day operations. Yes. Um, and just to, to remind you, one of the reasons people can't always make meetings because we all work. So when you call a meeting at 5 o'clock on a work day for some people, I think that's probably one of the problems, which was another reason that they work so well in our closed session. So. I think we're, we're both saying the same thing. It's yeah, just that, yeah. quite I honestly, moved, I moved it for good purpose. yes, yeah. but yeah. the but the the meetings, the reason we have them in our closed session is the entire board is part of them, and it's not um, taking away from the workday. And that way, people can be there because you shouldn't call a meeting and have no one show up. That's a that's a tough way to do things. So, Mrs. Herrick, I will echo the everything that was said about the sympathy orchestra. I love Romeo and Juliet and Harry Potter. So it was really great to see. Uh, it was really great to share the experience with my daughter and to see so many of you there, as well as so many people in our community and our administration. So it's really great to have that collaboration. Uh, last week, and I also attended the uh, Geology Museum open house at Rutgers, and I ran into some East Brunswick students there. So it's really great to see um, utilizing our resources when we have a great university so close to us that enables us to see like artifacts and fossils and, and rocks and students doing presentations and being involved and that's really great. Um, and I just want to throw out um, the special education parent advisory group. We have our next meeting on February 7th at 7 p.m. at Churchill and they're going to talk about um, there's going to be a transition planning presentation. So just wanted to make that announcement as well. So thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Can I mention, just I didn't even think about it. I'm looking out in the audience. I'm looking at our director of technology. I just want to mention something very quickly. He's like, and I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put you on the spot, Nick. Um, a number of us from the district were in Atlantic City last week at an event called Texpo. And it's an event where school district officials get together and they talk about the latest technology that's available uh, for schools and a lot of resources. And the thing I wanted to say is, I was down there and I couldn't believe how many people I ran into who looked at my badge, came up to me and said, I'm an East Brunswick graduate. And they were there with vendors, technology vendors. Oh, wow. And so I just wanted to say that, that the expanse of East Brunswick, that education, and related to the corporate sector is quite awesome. And, and these people are not just local either, they're spread around the country. 
coming back to Atlantic City to be part of these presentations. So I just want to mention that. Pretty neat. Yeah. Thank you. And I didn't get anything free as a result of it either. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. They should have. They got a good education yeah. from us, right? Yeah. Um, I'm looking at my ladies. We get to go for a motion to adjourn. So moved. And Ms. Glass and Mrs. Herrick. Who wants to go home? All in favor? Aye. Ah, there you go. Opposed? Abstentions motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.